Um, it is absolute pleasure for me to introduce Professor Amal Bishara today. Um, I have been um, such a fan of her work for quite a while now, um, from the early days when she wrote about media coverage of Palestinian intifadas. But I, I'd like to start by introducing her formally. Um, so Amal Bishara is um, Associate Professor and Chair of the Anthropology Department and affiliate faculty with the Department of Race, Colonialism, and Diaspora at Duft University. She is the author of the forthcoming um, book, Crossing a Line, Laws, um, Violence, and Roadblocks to Palestinian Political Expression, and that's coming out of Stanford this year. Um, and it talks about different conditions of expression for and exchange between Palestinian citizens of Israel and Palestinians in the West Bank. She also writes about popular refugee politics in the West Bank, attending to struggles over and through media, water, space, and protest. She is the author of Backstories, US News and Palestinian Politics that came out of Stanford University Press in 2013. And that is an anthropology of the production of US News during the second Palestinian Intifada in the early 2000s. Um, uh, working with youth at the Laji Center um, in Ida refugee camp, Beit Lahim, she has co-produced two bilingual children's books. I saw one of them, I'd, I'd like to get the other one. Um, one of them is The Boy and the Wall in 2005 and the Ida Camp Alphabet in 2015. She's also, she's so well-rounded. Um, she's also co-director of an award-winning documentary called Take My Pictures For Me that was um, issued or done, made in 2016 but with, and in collaboration with Muhammad, Muhammad Al-Azza. Um, she is on the editorial board of Journal Palestinian, for Palestine Studies and Cultural anthropology and is the president elect of the Middle East section of the American Anthropological Association. Without further ado, please welcome, uh, let's welcome Amal and please Amal take it from here. And thank you for coming. Thank you so much for the kind invitation. I'm so grateful to be here today with you all. Um, a big thank you um, to Dr. Latud and um, thank you to Sam Latud and also to pa Patrick Barrett and everyone at the Havens Right Center social justice, um, including Jenna and Adrian and Peter. Um, and thank you to all of you for joining us today. Um, so I'm going to share my screen here. Um, and you'll bear with me because this is in some ways a, this is a PowerPoint in progress. Um, so we'll see how some of these somewhat, we'll see how these slides work out. Um, so we'll start off in a city that I love very much and have not been uh, since before the pandemic. Um, so I like to feel myself moving to a new place um, as I begin to remember this time in 2011. So one summer evening in Haifa in 2011, a small group of Palestinian citizens of Israel protested in solidarity with Palestinian political prisoners who were on strike for, on a hunger strike for better living conditions. Protesters held framed photos of political prisoners whom the vast majority of Jewish Israeli society view as terrorists. Most of us had never met any of these striking prisoners in person. We had no easy way to capture or to communicate the experiences of these prisoners who had not eaten for days, who lived in the prison of those who regarded them not just as criminals, but also as enemies. Some of the protesters in Haifa that day blindfolded themselves and held their hands behind their backs as they kneeled on the cobblestone median of the main street. This was, I thought, a different kind of vulnerability than that of hunger. Visible solidarity with hated figures, bringing bodies low and close to traffic, denying themselves sight. The protest then wound down smoothly and it was dusk, that time in the demonstration when things can either turn more dangerous or more intimate, or they can dissipate entirely. A few people was st were still gathered near the treasured Palestinian cafes of Haifa's downtown. As an ethnographer, I always think it's very illuminating to listen to what happens at the margins of events, off stage as the crowd is half dispersing. 
in that twilight spate, spate, state, Walat Zbeth, who was then a locally loved musician and drama teacher, took to the center of a circle of protesters with a riff about Handala, who is a famous Palestinian uh, cartoon character. He's a child refugee with a patched shirt, bare feet, and spiky hair, created by Palestinian refugee Najil Ali in the late 1960s. Drawn in outline, he's usually depicted from behind, and one explanation of this stance is that he's looking back to his homeland, longing for and looking to the land from which he was dispossessed in 1948 upon Israel's establishment. In this way, he's a symbol of the right of millions of Palestinians to return to their home villages and cities. As a child, Najil Ali and his family had been pushed out of their Galilee village of a Shajara by Israeli forces in May, 1948, um, and he had then lived in Ain Helwa refugee camp in Lebanon, where 180,000 Palestinian refugees still live in some of the worst circumstances faced by Palestinian refugees. We were perhaps a 50 or 60 kilometer drive, as we were in Haifa, from the ruins of a Shajara, and perhaps 100 kilometers from Ain Helwa. Lebanon felt at once utterly inaccessible because the border has been closed uh, to illegal civilian traffic or crossing since Israel's establishment, but we also felt just out of reach in a way from Lebanon. Like the breeze might really carry a message from this dancer in Haifa to a cartoon character dreamed up by an assassinated cartoonist in the last century. Like Handala could maybe just turn his head and answer Spath. The, prisoner, the prisons where the hungry prisoners waited were closer. Um, Damun, Al Jalama, and Majiddo were all within 35 kilometers, all former British mandate detention facilities. They and the prisoners there, most of whom came from the military occupied um, West Bank, were out of reach, of course, in a very different way. You could drive by these prisons, but Israeli authorities tightly regulated visitors. So Walat Spate then continued this performance about Handala, um, and he really riffed just on the word Handala itself. So I'll, um, I'll give you a sense of what this sounded like. He said something like this, Handala, Handala, Hinnalizal, Ulimazal, Hanzal Nihon, Hon Hanzal, and Hinnalizal, Ulimazal. Or in English, something like Handala, be kind to those who remained and those who did not remain. I'll remain here, here I'll remain, and will be kind to those who remained and those who did not remain. He repeated this and his words accelerated as he repeated them over and over until applause erupted around him and he settled on the name again, Handala, suspended softly in the night. Interestingly, all of the, as you kind of hear from when I read this, all of the word, all of the sounds of that poetic phrase actually come from the name Handala, ha na va dala right? Uh, the, the hard H, the hard za sound in the middle, even the soft H sound at the end of his name. And uh, you know these sounds kind of signify Palestinian alterity, grace, and toughness for Palestinian citizens of Israel. And you could think that perhaps in, his, in the formal economy of just using those letters, he was echoing the formal economy of Handala's line, the line drawing of Handala himself, just a simple line drawing with which so much can be done. Spate articulates, uh, well, that Spate here articulates a determination to remain connected and committed to this land. The reorientation of this Palestinian revolutionary symbol here of Handala re reveals its fertility. Handala has been usually a symbol of the right refugees, but here Handala helps Zbeit to articulate a message of tenderness for all Palestinians, those who are pushed out and those who remain. By using the sounds of Handala's name to talk about these different relationships among Palestinians, he suggests that their experiences are deeply related. This tender love is kinder than nationalism. It's a graceful challenge to the fragmentation, dispossession, and shame that trouble so many Palestinians at what we could think about as this long matter of their liberation movement. Um, Palestinian nationalist political culture has tended to sideline Palestinian citizens of Israel, but they've found ways to re engage, reframe, and stay connected to other Palestinians. Sbeit is a powerful message for this linking of refugee narratives and narratives of Palestinians in Haifa, since his family is internally dispossessed or displaced from the uh, destroyed village of Ikrit in the very far Northern Galilee. I had fun with these maps, um, but Ikrit, you can actually see on the very, you can see Ikrit to the very, very right at the border here, right? So he wasn't pushed out of, um, 
of what became Israel. He did not become a refugee in international law, but he lost his village, you know, his family lost their lands in their village. Um, so um, it was moving for me as an ethnographer with experience living and working in a West Bank community with high rates of incarceration in Ida refugee camp to witness this brave Haifa standout for prisoners. Um, there are a few, there have always been a few cherished and honored political prisoners who are citizens of Israel, um, but most of the political prisoners are from the occupied territories of the West Bank and Gaza. So um, during these same hunger strikes in the West Bank, mothers and fathers and sisters and brothers and friends of prisoners and many former prisoners themselves would come to marches and solidarity tents set up in each city. They would cradle photographs of people that they wanted to hold in person. And they would sit in those tents for hours and hours, mirroring the endurance of striking prisoners, their presence an emblem of the stamina it indeed takes for family members to care for prisoners from afar, sometimes over many, many years. Being in these protest tents in the West Bank was intimate and it was painful, but in some ways it was less politically and perhaps also less physically risky than to kneel in the street in Haifa. In the West Bank, Palestinians regarded prisoners as heroic men and women or as vulnerable children, and they were beloved family members and friends. The Palestinian Authority, an institution, an administering institution in the West Bank that operates within the Israeli occupation has paid prisoners small salaries, recognizing what they what they see to be their, you know, the Palestinian prisoners service to the nation, and also many of these families dire economic need. So to stand with prisoners in the West Bank wasn't controversial. This is to say that the act of um, so this is to say that the act of standing in solidarity with prisoners in Haifa had a very different feel than to stand in solidarity with prisoners in the West Bank. Um, so the dangers and the discomforts and the very weight of loss were distinct, even if perhaps the photos of the prisoners that they carried might have been the same. So this book project that I'm working on, Crossing a Line, is about the distinct environments for political expression and action of Palestinians who carry Israeli citizenship and Palestinians subject to Israeli military occupation in the West Bank. Two Palestinian societies differently ostracized, differently endangered by Israeli settler colonialism and militarism, and differently impacted by displacement and empire. It embarks from the idea that expression is always grounded in place and in the body, and that recognizing this is especially crucial under conditions of militarized settler colonialism. So um, this is a map from the recent Amnesty International report. Um, and it just, you know, in a very basic way, the green line is, you know, the line that divides Israel from the 1967 occupied territories of the West Bank and Gaza Strip. Um, Palestinians make up approximately one fifth of Israeli citizens inside Israel's 1948 territories, while Palestinians in the West Bank are subjects of military occupation and make up about four fifths of the population of the West Bank, with the remainder being Jewish Israeli settlers. So Palestinians live with Jewish Israelis on either side of the green line, that armistice line that separates Israel's 1948 territories from the occupied territories, um, even though they live with them in very different terms. Palestinian citizens of Israel um, can vote and receive Israeli social services, though they are systematically discriminated against. Palestinians in the West Bank, some of whom were dispossessed of their homes and lands in 1948, are subjects of Israel's military, Israel's military occupation that began in 1967. They are, um, of course, unable to vote, and they're unable to access those uh, social services. But they are at the center of the dominant manifestation of the Palestinian national project, as it has uh, taken place since, you know, you could say the, the 1990s. That project is most obviously institutionalized in the Palestinian Authority, the state-like state -like assemblage that is um, over 25 years old and was meant to be a bridge to Palestinian statehood, but actually lacks anything resembling full sovereignty, as the term is generally employed. These two Palestinian groups are separated from each other by harsh Israeli movement restrictions. Um, so uh, for example, um, this is the sign that, this is some, one of the kinds of signs that one would see as you um, cross into Palestinian Authority areas of the West Bank, warning um, Israeli citizens not to enter. And um, I'm sure that many of you um, are familiar with the many different kinds of uh, movement restrictions that exist within the West Bank, the wall, the checkpoints, and many, many other uh, forms of restrictions of movement. 
Um, so these two groups of Palestinians um, live under different sets of laws as either citizens or subjects of Israeli military occupation. As a result, their forms of appeal and resistance have diverged and subtle tensions, you could say, have arisen between these two groups. Nevertheless, Palestinians in these two locations, which are of course made up of many, many other places with their own internal variations, managed to articulate similar messages against Israeli uh, oppression and for Palestinian liberation. And recent years have seen a growing convergence in the forms of protest. Um, okay. Um, you could also say that um, Empire itself is a backdrop to this story, both because of US support for Israel and also because US power tends to establish norms for various kinds of protest and forms of dissent. So that's just a little map of um, US aid and um, where, where it's distributed around the globe. Um, this is my very funky map illustrating the many different Palestinian places. I, so in my work, I'm thinking about, you know, Palestinians in Israel and Palestinians in the West Bank, but it's really important to recognize that all of these places are made up of so many other smaller places with great um, variation among them. Okay. Um, um, and Wala Asbet, who, uh, the person who started with this, this riff on Handala, um, you may know as a member of 47 Soul, one of the most exciting Palestinian um, musical groups out there today, and um, you should definitely check them out. Um, so his performance um, in, that, in that day in Haifa exhibits a logic of juxtaposition and of resignification a bricolage, you know, thinking about what handala means here and there all together, right? And this is a logic of juxtaposition that I encountered often in my work. You could think of the ethnographer, me, the anthropologist, as one kind of bricolore, working in the science of the concrete to make a collage of media, statements, and impressions that bring forward a larger truth. Um, but I also saw many of the people that I was writing about um, as doing the same kind of thing, bricolores, making politics out of the available lines of poetry, trees, stones, paths, homes, etc., working in a world certainly not of their own making in a struggle for liberation and life. Perhaps this is true of all political activism in that activists inherit a set of symbols and, and a material world from those that came before them. But I think it is especially true for Palestinians. Um, out of necessity and out of creativity, Palestinians work with what they have, often lacking the power to pave roads or protect archives. Um, okay, so um, I'll go back to this for now. Um, I should also note that the divide between Palestinians who carry Israeli citizenship and Palestinians under Israeli military, mil military occupation is only one part of a much larger and more complex story of Palestinian geopolitical fragmentation. Um, thinking about Palestinians in many, many different places as refugees um, in the diaspora and so forth. But um, I, as an ethnographer, I've been able to focus on a, a much smaller sort of group subset of Palestinians. Um, if settler colonial states seek to eliminate indigenous peoples through multiple tactics, including genocide, displacement and assimilation, we can think of geopolitical fragmentation and immobility as another means of trying to eliminate indigenous collectivities. Um, while fragmentation is often talked about as a key dynamic in contemporary Palestinian politics and scholarly work and art, its political implications are really um, have, have not been studied in depth uh, sort of head on, um, or they're just starting to be. Sometimes fragmentation only almost comes to the center of po public policy discussions. Um, in 2017, prominent legal scholars Richard Falk and Virgin Virginia Tilly co-authored a UN commissioned report that asserted the strategic fragmentation of the Palestinian people is the principal method by which Israel imposes an apartheid regime. This fragmentation operates to stabilize the Israeli regime of racial do domination over Palestinians and to weaken the will and capacity of the Palestinian people to mount a unified and effective resistance. Different methods are employed depending on where Palestinians live. This is the core means by which Israel enforces apartheid and at the same time impedes international recognition how the system works as a complementary whole to comprise to comprise an apartheid system. Some of you may remember that shortly after this report was issued, it was rescinded <laughs> following pressure from the United States. One key instrument of US empire is to regulate the bounds of acceptable discourse in diplomatic circles and beyond. Critique of Israeli policies inside its 1948 territory has often been considered out of bounds 
And here the analysis of how these two systems are related um, perhaps constituted a red flag. Nevertheless, in recent years, Palestinian, Israeli, and international human rights organizations, including Al-Haq, Badil, Beth Salem, Human Rights, Amnesty International, um, most recently, have issued reports that analyze Israeli rule across the green line, often using a framework of apartheid. Building on the precedence of Palestinian and then Israeli human rights organizations, for example, Human Rights Watch wrote in January 2021, about 6.8 million Jewish Israelis and 6.8 million Palestinians live today between the Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan River, an area encompassing Israel and the occupied Palestinian territory, the latter made up of the West Bank, including East Jerusalem and the Gaza Strip. Throughout most of this area, Israel is the sole governing power. In the remainder, it exercises primary authority alongside limits, limited Palestinian self-rule. Across these areas and in most aspects of life, Israeli authorities method methodically privilege Jewish Israelis and discriminate against Palestinians. So it remains to be seen how journalists and researchers will incorporate this new framework for analyzing Israeli rule. One thing we can say is that since I wrote this, um, you know, uh, uh, you know a, a new report has come from uh, Amnesty International emphasizing the same framework. Um, but it's true that in so many regards, we depend, uh, we incorporate and take for granted states definitions of places and populations, taking them to be neutral and fact-based. One of the goals of this project is to challenge those definitions of place. Um, so that's sort of an inf a little bit of an introduction to some of the framework of what I've been working on. Um, but in the remainder of the paper today, I wanna to talk to you about Nakba Day since it's springtime and Nakba Day is coming in May. Um, Nakba Day commemorates Palestinian dispossession. The, the Palestinian dispossession that was a result of the establishment of the state of Israel in 1948. It's a word um, for catastrophe, literally means catastrophe. Um, and it has crystallized Palestinian popular historical thought. Um, crucially, commemorations of the Nakba are constrained both inside Israel's 1948 territories and in the occupied territories of the West Bank and Gaza. Um, Israeli authorities have prescribed and even threatened commemoration since the first years of Israel's existence. Basic forms of political expression were illegal under the period of direct military occupation from 1967 to 1994 um, in, the, in the occupied territories of the West Bank and Gaza. Uh, and under civil law inside Israel's 1948 territories today, certain commemorations of the Nakba are also threatened by law. Um, as with other kinds of political practices in the occupied territories, Palestinians are threatened by outright military violence that is not tied to a particular law, while Palestinians are constrained in Israel's 1948 territory by law and threat of government sanction, even as the threat of physical violence looms. Palestinian awareness of these constraints is one reason that commemorations are continuous with protest. So we can't think of protest and commemoration as two separate things. Um, there are two related kinds of political practice. Um, and it's important to me that, you know, these, these happen every year and to some people they can start to feel really formulaic, you know, people even bring out some of the same like posters each year, for example, but, um, you know, really they're also um, in repetition, they evolve, they move forward, they make people, they bring people together to gather and think together. And that's some of the things that I want to exam uh, examine today. Um, and one very simple way in which thinking around the Nakba has evolved over the last 15 or 20 years is, um, people used to think about a Nakba uh, as a day of commemoration, remembering the Nakba, commemorating what happened in 1948. But um, in the last, you know, I would say again, like 15 years or so, um, it's really evolved to a thinking about the ongoing Nakba, the ongoing process of displacement and dispossession. And this is, of course, very interesting for scholars of settler colonialism who might think, wow, that really echoes one of the key phrases that we think about in terms of um, settler colonialism that comes from Patrick Wolfe. The idea that um, settler colonialism is a structure and not an event. It, it is an ongoing process, right? So Palestinian political thought um, has, you know, independently, you know, certainly come up with this. And these practices of gathering each year are one site where this, this thinking happens sort of together among Palestinians. So I'm going to talk to you today about um, a commemoration first in, in, um, in the West Bank and then inside Israel's 1948 territories. 
Okay, um, and I should say that a home base of a lot of my research in the West Bank and in general um, in Palestine is um, is um, in, is Ida refugee camp, which is surrounded on um, two and a half sides by Israel's separation wall and is just on the edge of um, Jerusalem, as you can see here. Um, so on this day in, in 2011, which of course was during the Arab Spring, the Arab revolts, um, I was in Ida refugee camp um, and we all got on a bus to go to a very nearby um, Palestinian village called Al Walaja. Really, if you can see my pointer, uh, Ida refugee camp is here and Walaja is right around here. Um, so here is Al Walaja. Um, and again, you know, Ida refugee camp is like right here. So it was a very short trip. And you can also see that Al Walaja has been profoundly hemmed in by the separation wall. The green line here is the green line. Um, and the, the, you can see here that the, the separation wall is um, on the West Bank side of that line in most places. And, um, and you can see how settlements have been encroaching on the land of Al Walaja, particularly Hargilo. Um, so we, we went on this bus from Ida refugee camp to um, Al Walaja, and we listened to local activists um, from Al Walaja, the kinds of brave and persistent women and men who are at nearly every demonstration, who often serve as guides and hosts for international visitors. And that day they were delivering speeches in English and Arabic that presented the history of Al Walaja and articulated core themes of Nakba Day about the right of return and the ongoing Nakba. Then a procession began. Um, Okay, um, as we began, we, uh, we passed by homemade placards for the right of return. Um, and I thought, as I looked at these, I couldn't tell if they were something that was up there because of Nakba Day or if they were just always there, like keys, burlap keys and burlap maps of historic Palestine. Um, you know, uh, signs that said return on them. Um, then we embarked from the center of the village towards the original village of Al Walaja. So Al Walaja had been, um, over here um, and the villages were displaced across what became the green line across basically to the other side of the mountain. And in, in, in this displacement, they lost a lot of land in 1948 and they had to rebuild their homes, but um, uh, they stayed on sort of the agricultural land of what was their original village. So one goal was perhaps to go back to the historic site of El Weleja during, during this procession. Um, so we uh, walked through the village, we walked across towards the mountainside and passed by rubble of homes that had been destroyed in recent years. Slabs of concrete smashed flat that showed the violence of this ongoing Nakba. Then we arrived at the edge of the village's houses. First we were on a paved road, then a dirt road, then a smaller path. We passed by the path that, that was then for the, um, the still to be built um, separation wall. Um, and we passed by the the equipment or the building materials for the wall, these huge concrete pipes laying there, they would become part of the wall's infrastructure. Some of the youth began to maneuver as though they might push one of those uh, down the mountain, but they realized how very dangerous that would be, and so they thought better of that. Some began to go down the hill towards army jeeps and police cars that had suddenly, suddenly started to appear to um, block the road. The army vehicles sat next to a beloved spring. Um, in uh, spring, um, where many of us, even those coming from Ida, have had happy memories of barbecues, donkey rides, youth trips with drumming circles, and slow afternoons arriving, uh, admiring the spring flowers, or how the water flows from this stone well. I thought to myself, if I have these memories as a person who visits only occasionally and is primarily based in Ida refugee camp and not in El Walaja, how do Alwalaja residents relate to these places, these places that were being threatened by the separation wall and the expansion of um, Israeli parks and settlements? I remember thinking how each place of loss is a site to be cherished, a site loved by residents and visitors in their own way. I remember looking across the train tracks on the opposite hill. Um, and I, could, I remembered how one, during one of those picnics with friends from Ida camp, a young boy had asked his father where that train went. His father had replied that the train went to Tel Aviv. Everybody that day knew the child would go to Tel Aviv or to the beach or to Jaffa no time soon. For Palestinians in the West Bank, Israel's closure policies 
are one of the most obviously discriminatory elements of life under occupation. And they're also central to Palestinians' feelings of restriction. Palestinians in Welaja were protesting dispossession, but they're also protesting the construction of, wall, of the wall. And looking to the green line, they're also protesting closure and these larger systems of discrimination that enable closure. Toward the end of the protest, dozens of protesters ventured down to the spring. They stood on the skeleton of an old house there and raised a flag, but nobody confronted the army on that day. Then we returned, um, we returned then to Ida refugee camp, um, to where we were staying. And um, you know, I, I, you know, I picked up my daughter, my very young daughter from the place where we had sort of, you know, given her daycare so she would be away from some of this um, potential um, danger um, and went to our home. And then we looked out our, our window um, and we were alarmed to find PA security officials armed or officers rather um, armed with AK-47s uh, stationed outside our house in Ida. They'd been positioned there to prevent a protest from emerging near the separation wall around Ida that was in places a mere 10 meters from the houses of the camp. A scuffle ensued between the PA soldiers in their green uniforms and black berets and residents of the camp over their presence and a perceived affront to one of them. As I watched from my window, it felt like I was seeing the curtain of PA complicity with the occupation pulled back. And I can talk more about that complicity if you're interested later. I snapped my pictures furtively as one of the soldiers glared back up at me. Um, we came home to other news too. This was again, 2011. Protesters in Lebanon and Syria had actively challenged the border of Israel, and some had managed to cross into Israel from Syria and Lebanon that year. During the tumultuous sign time of the Arab revolts, it was possible to cross what was usually one of the most highly fortified borders in the Middle East, because leaders were more concerned about preserving their power in the center of their territories. Um, but for Palestinians, policed by both Israel, Israeli and PA forces, um, it was impossible to cross from Israel's militarily occupied West Bank into Israel's territory that is under civil control. Um, nobody went that day, for example, nobody crossed Kalandia, although there had been, uh, you know, near Ramallah, there, there had been plans to, but nobody actually did, right? Palestinians in the occupied territories had deeply internalized the fact that crossing the Green Line would trigger grave Israeli violence. They'd been steeped in the stasis of decades of constraint and pervasive threat. And it didn't help that the Palestinian Authority was doing all it could to secure those lines as well. Um, three years later, in 2014, another group from Ida refugee camp um, and others from the Bethlehem region, uh, we were back in El Welaja for another Nakba Day protest, of course, with many people from El Welaja. Um, the construction of the wall and the settlement near El Welaja had continued. And in Ida, uh, sustained protests against the wall had, um, had transformed daily life. Berkeley researchers had recently declared Ida refugee camp to be one of the most tear gas places on earth. Trust in the PA had further decayed both in Ida and the West Bank as a whole. When the procession set out, we again passed by the same rubble of destroyed houses with flat roofs and protruding iron rods that we'd seen years before. I wondered about when these houses had been destroyed. And again, when I was preparing um, this lecture, I found you know, of course, this is again an ongoing process. Homes in Lualaja are still being destroyed. You can see this is a photo from January 2021. Um, I thought about how new rubble and old rubble can look the same and how this makes visible and material how catastrophe is not an event, but a situation. And Nakba Mustamirra once again. Again, we arrived at the top of the mountain <clears throat> and we saw that. Um, uh, we saw that several Israeli police jeeps, uh, jeeps awaited us on the street below. The street was an area that um, by then was actually even more off limits to Palestinians because uh, they had, the Israeli authorities had been expanding uh, a certain park system and other uh, areas. They were, you know, you, Palestinian cars could actually go less further by then, less far towards the green line by that time. Um, so uh, there were new coils of barbed wire and triplicate rolled in parallel to the street. Um, and the beloved spring was even less welcoming to Palestinians. Settlers were often there um, and the construction of this Israeli Refaim Stream National Park was underway. Once again, at the crest of the mountain, people decided whether or not to descend towards the road. So many had become emboldened to protest since 2011 in Ida Camp and in Welaja. Um, so um, 
So it had kind of become a different terrain for confrontation. Um, El Walaja was greener and more spacious than the camp, certainly, but the steep mountainside um, was, was offered its own uh, challenges to people. Um, people went down the hill in protest um, and then took the, uh, you know, started to sit in the middle of the main road there um, where those Jeeps had uh, stationed themselves three years earlier. Um, and you can see that Jeeps, uh, you know, were, were there nearby um, and, you know, sent quite a bit of tear gas in the direction of the protesters. Um, but people were insistent on challenging a little bit more of Israeli occupation encroachment on the street than they had in 2011. Um, for me, the road was familiar as my favorite fast road out of town. I knew its flowers, its spring flowers and its curves, but I'd never walked on it before. Standing on the road, I smelt, felt small next to the mountains. The soldiers shot more tear gas and finally there was a retreat. When at last we staggered up the hill, we were out of breath and many were overwhelmed by tear gas and exertion. A while later, soldiers met uh, protesters at the top of the hill um, and tore down the tent uh, where there had been signs and posters hung up and upturned some of the chairs. Several, several of the protesters confronted soldiers yelling at them and shoving them. These dangerous uh, skirmishes are a recognizable uh, way of con confronting Israeli soldiers, something you might remember from photographs and other imagery of, for example, Ahed Tamimi um, in the West Bank. Um, so it was at this Nakba Day commemoration that confrontation became the point. From commemoration to confrontation, something had changed in people's attitudes since 2011. As, as some of my activist friends might say, the barrier broke. People were no longer so afraid of tear gas or shouting matches with soldiers. Yet in staying on the road, still well beneath the railroad tracks, um, they still did not quite cross the green line. And even if they had crossed the green line on this rural mountain, they would not have truly challenged the politics of fragmentation that Israel has imposed, given that the mountain on the other side of the valley was uninhabited. So you can see here a crucial blurring of categories between commemoration and protest built on a locally cultivated commitment that because the Nakba uh, continues, a Nakba Mustamirra, resistance must also continue. Protest was a reassertion of place and belonging, as well as of identity. Despite scorched throats and cheeks wet with snot and tears, despite barbed wire in new and disorienting places, the protesters knew where they were on green Palestinian land, where even the rocks would serve those in struggle. Here, as in the protests against the war on Gaza, some Palestinians under occupation felt that symbolic practice should be joined to certain other kinds of action, especially direct confrontation with Israeli forces. Viewing the ongoing Nakba as violent, they, be they believed in an active and challenging commemoration of the Nakba. So now I'm going to um, switch gears and cross the green line and think about um, being inside Israel's 1948 territories. Each year since 1998, the Association for the Defense of the Rights of Internally Displaced People has organized a march of return in a destroyed village. And it's almost always been in the Galilee, but sometimes it has also been in the Nakhab. As an activist with this organization, Rola Nasr Mazawi described it to me, quote, the place they choose becomes symbolic of all Palestine. It becomes a little Palestine. In order um, to hold these marches, um, um, Palestinian citizens of Israel must obtain permits from the Israeli authorities for the events. And then in the space of a day, they have to set up a stage and chairs and exhibitions. They have to create parking spaces for you know, tens of thousands of people who are gonna come in places where of course there's no infrastructure for these kinds of gatherings because these are depopulated villages. These marches, um, those organized by this organization and other commemorations of the Nakba inside Israel carry more than one political message around return. They're an opportunity to highlight the experiences of internally displaced people within Israel who have no official leadership advocating on their behalf um, in an elected way and whose stories are not well known even inside Israel. These marches are that organization, Adrid's largest single event of the year. These marches are also a really important and rich opportunity to voice a commitment to the right of return for all refugees from inside Israel's 1948 territories, which is a relative space of privilege for expression to um, you know, an Israeli audience. 
If refugees in Lebanon hold a march calling for the right of return, Israeli authorities can completely overlook it. But when internally displaced people inside Israel's 1948 territories lead a similar march and thousands of others join them, then Israeli society must take note, even if in perfunctory ways. Its police officers must regulate it, reporters must cover it, and neighboring towns will necessarily notice it happening. So Israel has, um, Israeli leaders have been responding to this growing Palestinian movement with legal restrictions. The 2011 Nakba law, Nakba law uh, sanctions Nakba Day commemorations by allowing for the cutting of state funds to institutions that mark Israel's Independence Day as a day of mourning. So sort of limiting funding for commemorating the Nakba. While to date no one has been sanctioned under the law, it has created an atmosphere of threat for Palestinians. Um, and because the commemoration of the Nakba is so central to Palestinian political identity in Israel, this law is one of many legal mechanisms that declare Palestinians' exclusion from the national mainstream. As Nadra Shahub Kavorkin writes, quote, the settler colonial regime uses the Nakba law to legally portray the colonized as the other that endangers and threatens the democratic nature of the Israeli state, end quote. But the Nakba law has not ultimately stopped these commemorations from happening. So the 2014 Nakba, uh, sorry, March of Return was held on May 6th in Lubia, a depopulated village in the district of Tabaria, of Tiberias. Um, and this is a layer of maps that you can check out um, from uh, Palestine open maps here that show the, um, the village of Lubia, the, the current town that has been destroyed and depopulated, and the current town of Givat Avni. And there's also um, the Labi forest there that you can see on the edge of the screen. While most of Libya's residents are in Lebanon, Syria, um, and Jordan, a few remained inside, primarily in the village of Deir Hanna, less than an hour's drive away. Um, so this was an opportunity for everybody to get to know more about Libya. Um, an article circulating before that event um, described how the village had been liberated many centuries ago by Salah al-Din al-Ayubi, and that its villagers had played a role in the Great Revolt of 1936. So there was a, you know, these commemorations help teach people about local histories, very local histories. Um, so uh, that day also, I was traveling from Bethlehem with a friend, um, and it was such, and you know, hitting traffic because again, there's no infrastructure for these kinds of events, right? So it's sort of a difficult planning issue, if you will. Um, and um, when we finally um, Oh, well, so I should say that it's kind of speaking to the way that it's a very difficult planning issue. You know, there's no more sign to say Lubia, right? The village of Lubia. So to sort of give people directions, you can see this really kind of handmade sign that is put together on a barrier here uh, in contrast to the permanent, you know, signs um, marking the current um, uh, geography of the area, right? So finally, we parked our car in this very makeshift um, parking area. We walked out and we um, were greeted by the sign. The, you know, the, the village depopulated of its people, Lubia, welcomes the returnees. So automatically here, we are configured, we are placed, we are positioned as returnees. Walking to the main event through a pine forest, um, we saw people holding Palestinian flags and placards of village names. Up at the speaking stage um, were some of the same posters of destroyed villages that I'd seen before in other marches of return. And the speeches were similar too. But what stayed with me that most that day were these immense and beautiful, as you can see, um, portraits of people who'd been displaced from their villages. Often the portraits paired an older person with a younger person. Um, uh, and sometimes they were taken outdoors such that the green background of the photo um, faded seamlessly into the forest around them. A sign next to each of these uh, posters read something like, you know, in this case, we are from Lubia. And they gave the names of the people and then says that uh, return is a right and return is coming. The photographs were a way of bringing those who might not have been physically present into the demonstration itself. And perhaps more, even more significantly to suggest that you know, all refugees are returning, not just those from um, Lubia, Lubia rather. Once again, Palestinian citizens of Israel, in this case, Palestinians who've been internally displaced, were able to voice a message of return 
on, uh, and refugee rights on behalf of refugees who could not be there on that day. They're almost standing in for the dispossessed, exiled Palestinians on this territory of lost, loss. And I should say that also the sensed pleasures for Palestinians of participating in this walk, or these walks, because the same was really true in al Walaja, these really beautiful places, um, was undeniable. Walking through the land with friends. Oops. I thought I had one more slide there. Walking through the land with friends with a flag flying from a pole or tied around one's back, taking in the feeling of being together, sheltered by a sense of collectivity. So in conclusion, um, we can think about how political gatherings like these, where people commemorate the past and also call for land rights and right of return today, matter even when they do not seem to accomplish their immediate goal. Not only do they create collectivity and collective memory, um, and allow for, they allow for a discursive practice in which new things can be said alongside the reiteration of long-standing messages. And they also maintain the possibility for future action. Repetition is never just repetition. Palestinians, like so many other indigenous people and oppressed people around the world are playing a long game. We can see each of these acts of gathering as acts of sustenance, of exercising that collective. They are also embodied practices that help to develop political concepts like a Nakba Mustamirra, the ongoing Nakba. Nakba Day commemorations and the language of return also invite Palestinians to speak on each other's behalf in interesting and moving ways. One time I was in um, Jaffa and um, I saw a Palestinian holding a sign that says, that asked, really asked about the refugees who are, who, who are outside, um, who are in Lebanon and Syria, thinking about their homes and how some Palestinians today are living in the homes of refugees um, who have been displaced. Finally, historical commemorations like Nakba Day demonstrate a fundamental shared quality of Palestinian political practices that happen inside Israel, in the West Bank, and also in many other Palestinian places that I've not been able to address ethnographically here today. Um, this shared quality is important, even though commemorations may be organized with local priorities in mind. And those local priorities are very important, right? It's important to have that so local connection to events as well as to think about the broader narratives that, to which these are connected. Um, they're also a practice through which people become accustomed to gathering despite the risks of doing so. They transform public space by recalling Palestinian place names and returning Arabic to streets and public places. They also help people to learn about Palestinian histories and places, which are a revelatory practice, especially within the limits of Israeli closure. These practices of commemoration sustain communities and maintain the possibility for oppositional street politics by bringing Palestinians out into cities and onto Palestinian lands to make political statements on a regular basis. So um, I think that it's interesting, especially to look at the way that these commemorations happen on either side of the Green Line. Many people have looked at these commemorations in the past, but to look at them across the Green Line demonstrates the similarity in practice and also the way in which people are in bold and tentative and um, creative ways trying to speak together, even though they are geographically separated. Um, congregating to remember these shared histories and mark ongoing struggles not only helps to remake space, but also helps to strengthen the sense of a collective, a collective with many places and centers in it, right? And it is a practice also that makes the next gathering possible. So with that, I will turn it over to you all. Hope I didn't go on too long. Not at all, that was really wonderful. Um, thank you so much for that really pre fascinating presentation. So. Uh, we'd like to turn it over to, to those of you who are in attendance to ask questions or co make comments. Um, there are two ways you can do this, one of which is that you can go on camera and speak for yourself. That, and you do that by going to the reactions button at the very bottom of your screen at the far right. You click on that and then um, raise your hand and that'll alert me that you would like to go on camera. The other way to do it is to go to the chat and just write in a comment and then I can read it out for you and speak for you. So those are your two options. And depending upon the number of questions that we have at any particular moment, um, we'll try to take two or three at a time unless you all are acting a little shy. So the first one is in the chat. And this is from Leslie Martin who asks, 
Is there a sense of how Israeli citizens feel about these Nakba events, as opposed to in contrast to the response of Israeli military authorities? Thank you for that that's, important question. That's a, a good question to start out with. And we don't see another one yet in the queue. If you want to, please, again, don't be shy. Um, but we'll start with that question. Thank you so much. That is a really, really good question. And um, I should say that um, on my drive from Bethlehem to um, to Lubia that day, I have a lot of pictures of like basically driving by um, other uh, celebrations of Israeli Independence Day that were going on that time, right? Um, uh, so um, it's a really contested time and it's a time where, you know, sort of uh, Israeli nationalism becomes heightened for weeks and weeks before this Israeli Independence Day where you see a lot of flags, um, you know, flying from cars, um, you know, um, more than you do in this country before July 4th, you know, so um, I think there's no doubt that the prevailing sentiment in, in Israel is of not wanting to think about the Nakba and um, not really wanting Palestinians to gather to commemorate the Nakba. There is a law obviously passed by, you know, the majority of Knesset members that, um, you know, uh, penalizes um, um, the Nakba or commemoration of the Nakba. And, um, you know, they're obviously, you know, those are representatives of people who have been elected, right, you know, elected uh, by Israeli citizens. That said, it's super important to recognize that there are some fabulous and rich and very important organizations, among them Zohrot, who um, are very invested in um, helping for Jewish Israelis to think about the Nakba and to do the work of remembering and commemorating and learning. Um, Zohrot is here, uh, there's their name. And I believe that um, uh, um, I probably, I know that, I believe that I've cited them in some of these slides that I use today. But in any case, they're an important site. They actually have sort of uh, web pages about many, many different Palestinian villages and they work actually closely on, um, they work alongside um, Adrid for these commemorations as well. All right, so uh, we have another question that's been written in the chat and it goes as follows. This is from Jacob Zinn, who thanks you very much for the talk and says, I have been reading The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine by Ilan Pape, and as a Jew in the US, I find it very hard to talk about these topics with other Jews or people. When people ask me why I don't do birthright, I want, don't want to do birthright, I say that it's not my birthright. How do you think Jews in America can begin to have an anti-Zionist narrative that isn't dominated by the IDF Israeli government? So why don't you go ahead with that? Um, there's another one. Uh, why don't we take this one as well? Thank you, Amal. This is from Rina Mali. Can't wait to read your book. What do you think determines the shifts in Nakba Day marches in Al Walaja from commemoration to confrontation? Is it a strategic decision of march organizers planned beforehand? Is it often a reaction to repressive actions and policing against the Palestinians? Is it influenced by preceding political events? All right, why don't you take those two questions and in the meantime, others can think of the questions they'd like to ask. Thank you, those are both really wonderful questions. Um, so uh, uh, on my walk into work today, <laughs> I was uh, listening to a podcast, I believe by the Foundation for Middle East Peace featuring um, Maha Nassar, who's wonderful, and uh, Peter Baynard and um, a representative from Amnesty International on the use of the word apart apartheid. And actually Peter Baynard was really great on thinking about um, you know, how to sort of speak to a Jewish community around um, uh, these issues uh, in a way that tries to defuse some of the polarities and polarizations that happen. Um, and I should say that my project here, um, you know, anthropologists, we do have a little bit of a, I believe, a, a privilege of being um, kind of not generalists, right? So, you know, my project, in some ways, it is general because it looks at lots of different political practices, but it really does look at, you know, this is about Palestinians in the West Bank and in Israel. And, you know, it does this a little bit. Um, and that's not to say that I think, you know, I think it's very important to think also about sort of conversations and relationships among Palestinians and uh, Jewish Israelis or Jewish people. And as a faculty member, you know, I'm often thinking about how, you know, student interactions and engagements around this on campus. Um, so, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I had this chance to think about sort of how Palestinians can speak together, but I, I also sometimes hope that that can help us to reflect on how um, we can 
speak across other lines of difference um, and distinction, right? So, you know, when I think about how Palestinian citizens of Israel and Palestinians in the West Bank can sort of productively engage each other, I think it has to be with a recognition of the challenges that each of them face, right? They each face challenges and, um, and those must be acknowledged, the specificity of their experience and also the specificity of the strengths and what they bring to the table in struggling against, um, you know, a, a, a racist state, right? And I really do think that um, while the differences uh, between among Palestinians are different than the differences between Palestinians and Jewish Israelis or, you know, or in, in different ways in this country, you know, between um, Jewish Americans and Arab Americans, or however you want to kind of think about those different parts of these groups that are have an investment in this issue. I hope that some of what I say can inform that. I think that conversations and activism among these groups that recognizes all of what each of us can bring to the table because of our positions in a society that is what it is, right? Because of our experiences and because of the challenges that each of us face, you know? Um, we need to recognize those challenges and those resources and strengths so that we can build together towards, you know, movements for justice. And I do think that there are a lot of people who are doing that work. Um, so how do Jews in America, how can they begin to have an anti-Zionist narrative? I mean, I think that there are thriving spaces for those kinds of anti-Zionist uh, Jewish narratives. Um, you know, uh, you know, you can look to, you know, thriving organizations like Jewish Voice for Peace and, and many others to, to start thinking about this. So I feel grateful for those organizations and the hard work they're doing. Um, and um, yeah. Um, and to this wonderful question about what, yeah, it's a very hard question about what determines those shifts in the Nakba Day marches in Al Walaja. So I, um, you know, uh, uh, in some ways, both a limitation and an advantage of my work as ethnographer is that I was really quite based in Ida refugee camp. So for me, I really was watching what have, you know, and, and it's true that a lot of the people at the demonstration were from Al Walaja because the way it works on these Nakba Days is that people go to, there are lots of things happening. Uh, partly because of Israeli closure. There's not necessarily one big event. So this was like the regional event. Um, and there was like, so there was like a big bus that, you know, went from Ida and there were other, of course, a lot of people from al -Walaja. And I think, um, so I was very aware of like in 2011, sort of there hadn't been as much um, street protest going on, but by 2014, there had been quite a bit, at least in Ida and to a certain extent, and also I think in al -Walaja. So people were just more accustomed to that kind of protest. I don't think that it was about, um, I don't necessarily think it was a strategic decision of March organizers planned beforehand. And I do think that can often be, yes, often be a reaction to repressive actions and policing against Palestinians. I think that there are uh, definitely cases where organizers will say, this is an event that you know, needs to stay really carefully organized with no stone throwing or no this or no that because we have children or because there's this or that or the other thing. Um, so that does happen. But um, my sense is that a lot of times also sort of things unfold in the moment related to a lot of things happening around oneself. Like, so the confrontation that happened back up at the tents, the Israeli soldiers arrived to take down these signs and kick over the chairs and people reacted to it you know, in a confrontational way, but of course also with a really kind of a limited confrontational way because they knew that if they, you know, reacted too forcefully, again, things would have escalated dramatically and become very dangerous for everybody there. Um, so yeah, and I do think that, you know, thinking about the broad context of the Arab revolts or other kinds is, is important as well. All right. Um, so we have another question in the chat, this, this one from Tia. Uh, and I th it looks like we've got a few others. So let's let me read out these three questions. Greetings from Indonesia. Excellent presentation. I have never been in Palestine, but my other colleagues were there, one representing UNDP via ACT networks and two via informal networks facilitated by the CSOs. I have only one question. How do these refugees share their narratives, narratives to other foreigners when their narratives uh, when there were not when they were not allowed to share particular electronic devices because as far as i noticed they brought some print materials back to indonesia thanks in advance i'm a sociologist with a past educational background on muslim culture and societies female indonesian salafari media networks then we have one from Cla Ciaran mckenna 
you mentioned earlier about the complicity of the Palestinian Authority. Could you expand on this and talk about the relationship between Palestinian people or that the one they have with the PA in the occupied territories? And then finally from Abdul, thanks for the presentation. Aren't you accused of being anti-Semitic or self-hating Jews by Zionists? Well, I'll take the very last one. I'm very rarely accused of being a self-hating Jew because <laughs> I'm, I'm Palestinian, um, uh, but uh, sorry. Um, these are very serious uh, accusations and they're really um, unacceptable. You know, uh, they're unacceptable because people who are criticizing, and I mean, I, I, you know, we need to stand together to stand against all forms of racism, right? And, and that of course includes anti-Semitism. And we have seen dangerous forms of anti-Semitism, um, you know, potential on the rise and on the rise um, in this country and beyond, right? We also see anti-Arab and, and Islamophobic racism. We see anti-Palestinian racism. And obviously we see many, many, unfortunately, many other forms of racism, anti-Black and other, right? And they are interconnected in this country, right? And we need to understand the interconnections among them to stand against them, right? Um, well, I think that for a lot of Americans, we become sort of contextualized deeply in the United States, and we don't think about how these racial ideologies uh, transfer and operate globally. Um, and we need to kind of, I think that we all have a responsibility um, to, or at least uh, people like me have a responsibility to start to sort of do the work of showing how they're connected and how they reinforce each other, and also showing how different forms of racism operate distinctly, right? You know, um, um, so uh, yes, these accusations of being anti-Semitic for criticizing Israel um, are very problematic because they reduce criticism of a state with um, racism against a people. Um, and, uh, you know, I think more and more people are becoming aware that this is a problematic and false equation. Um, and all we can do is continue with dignity to stand in solidarity with people who are you know, experiencing Israeli state violence every day, right? Um, and also to continue to solidarity, stand in solidarity with all people who are facing, you know, racism against them, um, uh, whatever their background or religion be, right? Um, uh, the complicity of the PA. Um, so the complicity of the PA. Um, well, I mean, the complicity of the PA is happening on so many different dimensions at this stage, um, like literally security co collaboration such that there's like shared information between the Palestinian Authority and Israelis, uh, Israeli authorities about, you know, who, who is uh, causing trouble. <laughs> um, uh, you know, uh, there's that kind of security co co cooperation, th this kind of, you know, the, the kinds of things that you can see on the street in um, as, as we saw in Ida refugee camp, you know, that wasn't a one-time thing. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, there's a growing skepticism of Palestinians in the West Bank about and, and you know, uh, critique uh, of the Palestinian Authority because uh, the Palestinian Authority is corrupt and undemocratic. And it, it, you know, it's not a liberation movement, right? It's become all the, you know, worst things of a, of a, of, a, of a repressive state or many of the worst things of a repressive state without being a state, right? And um, really kind of facilitating um, Israel's continued occupation. Um, so um, yes. And I do think that refugees, uh, you know, Palestinians, there are lots of limits to how Palestinians are able to um, express themselves and distance and language and many other things. Um, but I do think that really there's also a wealth of, um, Resources online. Um, there's also the Nakba archive, um, which where you can really hear from narratives of refugees about the Nakba itself, for example. Um, so there are a lot of great resources where refugee stories are brought to the fore. All right. So we're the queue is open, the stack is open. So anybody here, we have a, long, a good question from Pete Roman. Um, he says, I'm from the UK and mainstream discourses in the media and politics on Palestine have shifted significantly in recent years. The Labour Party, for example, has adopted the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism and have stated the criticism of the state of Israel should be considered anti-Semitic. Party members have been expelled on this basis and former Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn has been suspended. This has offset previous trends in UK politics, which indicated increasing support for Palestine. Opinion polls 
for example, showed increasing support for Palestinian sovereignty year on year. I know this isn't the topic of your talk, but could you comment on the changing dynamics of international solidarity with Palestine? Do you think the BDS strategy is working? And what do you think the focus of the international solidarity movement should be going forward? Just, so a, few a, easy, just a few easy questions. <laughs> yeah. And then Jacob Zinn has another question, which is I'm not familiar, very familiar with the PA, but are the issues with it a product of its creation and structure or has it been corrupted over time? So why don't you handle those really easy questions? <laughs> Um, well, I mean, I think we have to think about this as a site of struggle, right? You know, so yes, as you mentioned, right, you know, there had been advances and gains for thinking about uh, Palestinian, you know, justice for Palestinians. Um, and sort of the, the pushback has been to use this slur of anti-Semitism. Um, it's been successful in certain cases. There are also anti-boycott laws in this country, um, you know, so, um, and there are, you know, pushes, of course, you know, to, um, to, to use the to adopt the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism in this country in many different contexts. Um, it, yes, this is something that I've thought about, uh, but I'm not up with all the exact details right now. I believe that there's been a strong and forceful pushback from, like, I believe the LSE. LSE has a good statement. If anybody wants to correct me on that, and I know that there's a great um, new website um, led by Jewish acad academics in Canada that addresses um, uh, this issue and also, and I think you could probably Google that pretty easily. And also a Jewish Voice for Peace has good resources on this. Um, so again, I think we have to think about this as a site of struggle. I think that, um, I mean, Israel dismissed, I believe that Israel Israel dismissed um, the Amnesty International report as anti-Semitic. I mean, you know, at, at a certain point, the strategy becomes somewhat difficult to maintain. Amnesty International is one of the most prominent human rights organizations in the world, and they are echoing the you know, the exact, you know, the report of Human Rights Watch, which was echoing the report of B'Tselem, Israel's foremost human rights organization, and they're all building on work of Palestinian and and other Israeli and other international organizations. You know, this slur, um, you know, at some point doesn't um, make sense, right? Um, in terms of what, um, but, but, but that doesn't mean that we don't need to kind of counter it in clear and factual ways over time. And there are people doing that good work. The, the focus of the international solidarity movement going forward, I mean, I'll just highlight a few things that are just absolutely crucial right now. Um, six, uh, relatedly, six Palestinian human rights organizations were recently declared terrorist organizations by Israel, um, including Adamir, um, DCI Palestine, Al Haq. Um, those are the three Palestinian human rights organizations and three other civil society organizations. And, um, you know, this is a, an attempt to uh, strip those organizations of the ability to function and to get funding from the European Union um, and to delegitimize the kinds of information that they are creating. Um, and in some ways, this, this, I think of this in some ways because the allegation that criticism of Israel is always anti-Semitic is similar to the kinds of accusation that these organizations are, are terrorists. There are legal structures in place to say that if an organization is a terrorist organization, they can't be funded by, for example, the EU, right? So Israel can declare, and Israel has the capability to declare them terrorist organizations. Does it have the data to back them up? No, it does not, right? So what do we do with these sort of state declared you know, declaration, they are a terrorist organization, but it does, there's no, nothing to substantiate it, right? We need to, you know, stand up for these um, human rights defenders, make sure that they can continue to do their work and make sure that we can hold on to words so that they continue to have meaning, right? You know, uh, you know like <laughs> make sure that we, we can continue to use the word antisemitism so that we can continue to combat real antisemitism, right? Make sure that we know what we, we mean when we say the word terrorist so that we can, you know, um, have reasonable conversations about these matters. The other thing I'll highlight um, from a pers perspective of academic freedom is that right now Israel has recently issued an order um, saying that um, Palestinian uh, institutions of higher education um, will not be able to hire foreign faculty, faculty that don't have PA or Israeli um, identification cards or statuses will not be without Israeli approval, right? Um, and this is a severe attack on the academic freedom of Palestinian institutions. Um, 
And of course, many of these quote foreign faculty are in fact Palestinians who just don't have legal right to live in the occupied territories because of Israel's racist residency rules. So um, that, there's a Birzeit campaign about this um, that y'all should check out and we need to be organizing so that Palestinian institutions of higher education can continue the good work that they do to build a better future for Palestinians. Um, so yeah, these attacks on human rights organizations and on um, um, uh, uh, higher ed are, you know, are, are, are key and we need to be rallying around them. Uh, the PA, it, yes, the problems with the PA are indeed a, um, uh, in some ways, a problem from of the inception of the Palestinian Authority, um, which was meant to, which in some discourses was meant to lead to a state, but in fact, that the, the structures were really never in place for that to happen, and it was always sort of operating within the Israeli occupation. Um, and so, when you have that kind of a structure, um, you you end up with this kind of an outcome, which is not to forgive the actions of the Palestinian high leadership that has sort of made this all happen on a day-to-day -day and year-to-year -year basis. Um, so that's to say that, yeah. All right, um, so Adrian Padgett would like to ask a question. So she's got her hand up. Thank you so much, Professor Bashara, uh, for the excellent presentation and talk so far. I will uh, pitch you uh, maybe a lighter question, I hope, um, which um, uh, surrounds um, I, or I have a, I have a number of questions or reflections, and maybe this will be discussed in your forthcoming book. Um, but I'm really curious about the practice um, of gender in these spaces. So when I think about, um, and and I am not, uh, I I haven't done any reading, unfortunately, on settler uh, colonialism. So um, thinking about it as a structure, not as as an event, um, it, it seems pretty profound to me. But your your delineation from a practice of commemoration to that of confrontation. To me, I wonder, is that not, could we not see or or might one see commemoration as being uh, more feminine and confrontation more masculine? And I'm curious about the ways in which people embody or participate through gendered lenses in these, in these two very important, but um, perhaps different expressions of um, a collective, uh, and, and, and proactive, I, I don't want to say proactive reaction, that sounds um, kind of contradictory, but uh, you know what I mean, like how, how yeah. um, what does that look like um, in these spaces and what, what have you seen? So um, there are strong histories of women being involved with um, the same kinds of confrontation of Israeli soldiers that um, men have been involved with. Um, women have played a key role, particularly sometimes of trying, I mean, you know, women sometimes are able to confront soldiers sometimes more directly than uh, men because, um, you know, not, not always, but sometimes, you know, there will be a hesitation um, in, a, in a reaction to a woman. Uh, we, you may have seen the, um, you know, confrontation between um, Ahed Tamimi as a girl and an Israeli soldier who, uh, that, you know, went viral and, you know, um, so, um, um, you know, I think thinking about gender and settler colonialism in this context is a really crucial issue. And, um, you know, thinking about how uh, settler colonialism and particularly Israeli, colonial, is, is, you know, Israeli um, structures of violence and repression um, impact uh, men and women and girls and boys differently is really crucial. Um, and, and how uh, those structures interact with sort of the norms and habits of Palestinian society. And, you know, um, so there is, um, yeah, and it's something that I look at a little bit. I, you know, the one, one case in the book is to think about how um, um, in one case, Israeli authorities were arresting a woman, but they took her father as well. And so this was, she felt that this was a way of sort of making the arrest even more patriarchal because it was like not treating her as a an independent person who could be arrested on her own terms and a way also of sort of imposing ex additional shame on her and on the family by taking her father as well. So there's often a, a collusion between patriarchy and occupation. Um, and um, yeah, it, it plays a big role in shaping people's, um, you know, gendered identities and, and the kinds of sort of positions that they're able to, to make. Thank you for that important question.
Okay, so the stack is, is open for anybody who would like to ask a question at this point. I'll, um, if no one else is going to, I didn't want to, to ask because I wanted to give others um, the space. Um, I, the, the one question that I have, I mean, there are a number of questions, of course, but we can talk about them at some other point. But one of the questions is about the kind of the collective Palestinian experience, right? And so the fact of the matter is that there is people, Palestinians within the West Bank experienced occupation and settler colonialism in a very different way from Israelis, from Palestinians within Israel and from Palestinians in Gaza or in refugee camps or in, um, in the diaspora. So there are multiple experiences of Palestinians that give them different viewpoints about what the, what the issues are and how to deal with them and how to um, kind of resist and bring out. And you brought out the, the issue of return and how it became a kind of a unifying project um, for the Palestinians within Israel, within Israel and Palestinians in the West Bank. And that's beautifully done. And I was wondering, what is, um, and there was, there has been a move, right, in the mm -hmm. in recent months, and especially with the recent attacks on Gaza, there has been a move towards unifying Palestinian kind of experience again, right, reunifying our understanding. I wonder what, I mean, there are no guarantees, I know that, but I, I wonder if you can say something about that, because it's very, I mean, from my perspective, it's very fragile, right? Mm -hmm. um, there are no permanent kind of assumptions about what what brings them together or what unfolds that that unity. So if you can say something about that, just to to give me an idea about how you're thinking about those collective kind of ideas about the Palestinian and Palestinian struggles. Thank you so much for that question. And it's really like at the heart of why I embarked on this project. And um, yeah, so I mean, I think you're in, so the Intifada of Dignity and Hope, as you mentioned, was like a, 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 an uprising last May where the, the key theme was that it was about unity. And there was called, a, I'm sorry, it was called the Manifesto of Dignity and Hope. And, you know, it's really an expression of unity and against fragmentation. Uh, so that was from May 2021. Um, and I, I think that I agree with you that it's fragile. And it's also so interesting because, and in some ways, I started this project because. Um, although obviously I, I, I'm U I am US born and I lived my whole life here, uh, but I uh, have had the uh, privilege of being able to have connections to uh, Palestinian communities inside Israel and in the West Bank. And for me, as a person who is, you know, an outsider, really, you know, fundamentally an outsider to both of them, even though I'm Palestinian, it was so interesting to me, um, you know, I think when you're an outsider, you're like often, you know, especially like as a Palestinian American, like kind of trying to fit in or trying to figure out how to do the right thing or whatever, and how to do the right thing in, in these different contexts is very different, right? Or, you know, how to fit in is different anyway, right? So even people who agree on sort of the, the big policies, you know, the activists who might've written that manifesto of dignity and hope, they might agree on all the big policies, right? For example, but they, I, I think that many people still have sort of an everyday sense of politics that's that's different. It just comes from sort of where you wake up in the morning and what you see out your window. And so I think paying attention to the texture of politics in that way is really important. Um, that's why I agree with you that it is very fragile. Um, so, um, and I hope that the more that, you know, I mean, I, I hope that sort of this book in some ways is, is an invitation to others to continue doing this work, to think about everyday political experience from wherever you are, you know, uh, you know certainly for Palestinians and, and, and Jewish Israelis and others who want to work together for justice, but even maybe for all of us to just think about how our politics is grounded in what we see every day and who we interact with every day. And that even though we might be kind of wanting or expressing certain kinds of goals for justice, you know, wherever we are, that we need to find ways to acknowledge how the everyday shapes those and our comfort levels, our, you know, our visions of politics. So yeah, I don't know if that was a great answer, but that's exactly what I, I agree with you. It is fragile and I don't know where things are going, but I do think, I mean, honestly, this manifesto of dignity and hope was very big. And I think the fact that Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International are all talking about 
you know, Israel, uh, Israel, all the ter all the so territory that Israel uh, controls is extremely important, you know. And if more and more activists get on board with that, that's helpful. And if more and more Palestinians um, and activists and non -pa non activist Palestinians who are living there um, can um, you know, keep up this momentum, I think that it will be a, it will be a big thing. And then perhaps the big question is what about refugees who are outside of historic Palestine, not under Israeli sovereignty, not in Israel or the occupied territories, because you can't really frame a real movement for justice without acknowledging their very important claims. Okay. We, we have time for one other question. If anybody wants to put one forward, uh, we just have a few minutes left. Um, anybody want to take a shot <laughs> at that? Um, in the absence of which, maybe you, Amal, you want to offer some parting comments of your own, um, sort of to wrap everything up. I would just, you know, uh, say thank you for all being here. And um, Uh, again, I do think it's important to check out those issues of standing up for human rights defenders, and um, and uh, and also for you know academic freedom, and to really think concretely about what we can do to um, to uh, you know really make it possible for Palestinian movements to continue because they are threatened in so many different ways, right? Um, so supporting um, those kinds of organizations and structures of civil society is absolutely. Um, crucial. All right. Well, I hope everybody takes that seriously. And we want to thank you very much for what was really a fascinating talk and, and a stimulating conversation. Um, I just want to take the, an opportunity um, to plug the talks we have coming up um, very next week, uh, April 7th at 12 noon US Central Time. Julian Goh will be speaking on militarizing the police in the US and Britain, empire and the global color line. And then we have several other talks in April, and we want to in, encourage you to take those in. Um, you can find details on all of those on our website, including how to register. Um, so thanks again very much. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to share with us um, a, a preview of your upcoming book. And um, I'm sure that many of us will want to take, take advantage of that and read your book. So Thank thanks you again. again. Thank you all again. Thank you for the invitation. And Thank all you, Emil. All right. Take care, everyone. Thanks.